such an honor to see what God is birthing. I remember when this was just a dream. When Brian and Ashley talked to Trudy and me and said they felt God leading them to Las Vegas to plant a church. And this was just a dream. But this is just the beginning of the dream. Don't think this is over. When I hear someone say, we're getting ready to start two services, I know God is favors. And I know what you, there's always the groan when you go to two services too. Oh no. But let me, let me encourage you. God is up to stuff. And, and uh, I was talking to uh, my son that followed me as the pastor of City Church. He sent me a text and said, well, we, we broke a record today because we have two services as well. He said, the early service today broke a record. And, I, and he said, we had 400 people here at early service. And I said, wow. And, I, and you know, we were, we were glad when we had 250 at early service. And it's, a, it's the favor of God. And so God has put you here to reach this community. God has put you here to impact this city. And this is just the beginning. You have a great mission field. This is a mission station. There will come a time, not too far away, that this corner of this building won't be big enough for you. And so you'll say, Lord, what do you have next? Well, here's the deal. When that point comes, God will open the door. It will be the right moment. It will be the right time. And so I just thank God for what God's doing through your wonderful pastor and wife. And Trudy and I are just thrilled to be here. As a pastor of one church for 40 years, we have gone through many seasons and many cycles and many things. Some of the things that I have felt led to do something, and I look back on it and I said, God, it was this you. I remember one time I decided we needed to have some early morning prayer services. And we were going to have a season of about two months where I invited people to come to the church at 5.30 in the morning on Tuesday. Problem was, it was February. And that's cold in Chattanooga in February. Never thought about it. And I thought, if the Koreans can do it, if they can get up, we need to pray. We need to ask God to do something. And so I announced it. I pushed it and all these kinds of things. And then the next thing I know, the morning came. I set my alarm clock and I got up. And did, I, I didn't get up saying, good morning, Lord. I got up saying, good Lord, morning. <laughs> uh, you know, I kind of got up and said, okay, let's go. I stumbled, you know, washed my face and you know, brush my teeth. I didn't. Even, I, I'll take a, I said, I'll take a shower when we get back from the prayer meeting. You know, so I went and I went over there in the dark, opened the door, turned on the lights, expecting you know, you know, hundreds of people were coming, and they flooded in by the ones and the twos. And at five thirty, we had eighteen people there. Now, some more came in, and we ended up having maybe forty. But I said, praise God, we're going to pray. And of course, I was kind of down. And I was over in the corner, and I have a tendency to walk and pray. I just pray and walk. And I, was, I had me a spot. I just walked this spot. And I was praying to the Lord, oh God, would you let your spirit move in this church? That's what I was praying. Would you let your spirit move? And I was interceding, God, let your spirit move in a fresh way. Let your spirit move in a powerful way. And I heard this whisper in my heart, and I knew it was God, it was almost like it was audible too. I went, whoa, because it was like God interrupted me. And here's what I heard the Lord say, my spirit's always moving. And I stopped. And I said, that's right. Your spirit's always moving. And I'll show you in the scripture in a minute where that's proven. Your spirit's always moving. And this is what I heard the Lord whisper. You just need to raise the sail. You see, the Spirit of God is always moving. And what we need to do is know how to raise the sail and catch the wind. And that's the title of today's message, Catching the Wind. You see, the Holy Spirit has the power to transform our lives. God, however, never imposes His power on us. It comes to those who are yielded. It comes to those who are invited. It comes to those who want to follow the Holy Spirit. Those who, want to, those who want to be filled with the Spirit, as the Bible says. And I want to look at one passage that we're going to unpack today that talks about that whole idea of being filled with the Spirit. It's in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. And we're going to share it together. Paul wrote this. Now Paul was, you know, was, a, was, a, was one of the early followers of Jesus who started out as an opponent 
to Christianity as a hater of Christ who had a dramatic conversion and ended up writing much of the New Testament. He was writing this to a church in Ephesus, to the, to the pastor of the church, to the elders. He was very close to this church. He spent more time in Ephesus than any other church he planted. He spent on two different visits. One was 18 months, one was up to three years. He spent a long time in Ephesus. This was a key church. And so he writes them and he says, Therefore, do not be foolish. And that Greek word for foolish literally means don't be stupid. You know, Paul was really blunt. He said, don't be stupid. Most of our translations get, you know, soften it and say, don't be foolish. But he was really saying, look, don't be stupid. But understand what the Lord's will is. Now, interesting. Paul says, I want you to understand what God wants. And so he says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And there were major temples to the god in Bacchus, which was the god of wine in, in the Greek and Roman world. And they were there. So they had, you know, it was like, every, you know, but it was basically like bars and nightclubs, but they went to worship their god there. So he's telling them, don't be like the others. Instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now I'm going to unpack this for you because I want us to see this because it has great relevance for us who want to follow Christ. First of all, we're going to start with a little bit of Greek. Never heard anybody. I want, we're going to give you a little bit of Greek. It's written in Greek and I'm not, I'm not, I don't usually spend a lot of time on this, but this word is so meaningful I cannot ignore it. The word filled there is the Greek word Pleroho. Everybody say that word. Pleroho. Say it again. Pleroho. Hey, at least if you, if you got nothing else out of the sermon, you learn one Greek word. Okay? Pleroho. And it has a primary meaning. When I see the word filled in English, I often think, well, that's like filling up a cup, you know, filling up a bucket. And, and, and that's an okay way of thinking about it. But this Greek word has a primary meaning that doesn't have anything to do with filling up a bucket. It actually means catch the wind. It was used in ancient times when they referred to a ship who put its sails up and when the, when the billows of the wind and the, and, the, and, the, and the sail of the ship was fully stretched and the ship was moving under the power of the wind, they would say, Plero! It has caught the wind. The wind has filled it. It's under the power of the wind. So when Paul said, be filled with the Spirit, that was the metaphor he was seeing. A ship with its sail raised, moving under the power of the wind. You see, the Holy Spirit, as the Lord reminded me that morning, cold morning in February, is always moving. He's God in motion. He, you know, if you think about it, where's the first reference to the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Genesis 1-2. What does it say? And the Spirit was moving over the face of the waters. You see that He was moving. The Bible tells us, Peter tells us, he said this book, Holy Scripture, came as holy men of God were moved by the Spirit. When the angel appeared to Mary and mentioned that she was going to give birth to a child, and she says, I can't, I, 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 I'm a virgin. He said, the Holy Spirit will move. See the new birth. You know, Jesus taught Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that the new birth was brought by the moving of the Spirit. He says the wind blows where it wills. But here's the interesting thing. The word wind and the word spirit and the word breath in the Greek language is the same word. It's the same word. It's pneuma. We get our word pneumonia from it. Our pneumatic drills. It has to do with wind and power of the wind. or power of breath. And so when Jesus told, her, told, told um, Nicodemus that, that he has to be born again by the Spirit, he says, because the wind moves wherever it wants to. He says, don't you worry, Nicodemus. This is not about you trying to turn over a new leaf. This is about the power of the moving of the Spirit in your life that will change you. So much so, it'll be like a new birth. Now, he told Nicodemus about that, but no one was born again before the cross. He couldn't be born again before the cross because the price for sin had not been paid. So where do we see the first incident of someone being born again? It's in the 20th chapter of John after the resurrection. Jesus appears to the disciples in a room. 
And what he did was quite ironic. The Bible said Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? He is like the breath of God. He's the movement of God. It's the same thing that happened when God formed Adam and, and, and out of the dust. And what did God do? God breathed into him the breath of spiritual life. And Adam became not just a living being, he became a living soul. A spiritual nature. Because of sin, we've all, we're born, I tell people, we're born, still born, spiritually. The Bible says we're born dead. How does that come to life? When God, when we trust Him and we confess our sins and we believe in Him, God does the same thing He did for Adam. He breathes on you. And you become now another living soul. The life of God. And when we saw Jesus breathe on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Yes. And that's the same thing that happens to you when you're born again. God breathes on you and new life comes in. You see, the Spirit's always moving. The Spirit's always at work. On the day of Pentecost, when they were waiting for this, this power of the Holy Spirit to come, not knowing exactly what that was going to be like. You see, they were waiting there not having a clue what it was going to be like, but they just knew, I think we'll know when it happens. And they did. They did because they said they heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole place. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all had their sail up. The idea was stay, brethren, in that room with your sail up. And when the Spirit comes, you'll know you're moving. You'll know there's energy that has entered the presence. The key is keeping the sail up. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But sometimes it's hard to keep the sail up. Because life is coming at us pretty strongly. So the word pneuma, the Greek word pneuma, is the word for wind or spirit. Now, let's look back at this passage and think about it. Paul said to them, be filled. Let's talk about that word filled. First of all, we know it means capture the wind. It means get the sail up. But it's an imperative. It's a command. Uh, an imperative means this is not a suggestion. To Christians, to the church at Ephesus, and to the church here in Las Vegas, God is saying this is not... An option. This is not something you can take it or leave it and say, you know, hey, you will never, ever, ever be successful living the Christian life in the power of your head knowledge or the power of your strength. You have to have something more. That something more is the power of the Holy Spirit moving your life. Amen. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the helper. He's the one called alongside to help us. He said he's a helper. You need help. We need help. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm not going to leave you just here and looking up at the sky saying, well, when is Jesus coming back? Because we have a work to do. We have, a, we have an enemy to conquer. So what do we do? We say, Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, I want to follow you and I want my sail up. I'll tell you a little later about how you get your sail up. But it's a command. Interesting. It's also a present tense command. Now, the Greek language, I don't know, I, I do, in this one passage, I do, I don't, honestly, Brian knows, he's heard me preach some Brazilian sermons, I don't be Greek around, but every now and then, you just got to say, what does this mean? The Greek has many different tenses. We have past, present, future. The Greek has gobs of tenses, and they all have nuances. If it's present tense, it means continue. You see, so he's really saying, continually, continually be filled. Continually keep yourself up. Don't have it up today and put it down tomorrow. Have the spiritual sound of your life up. Another thing is plural. He wasn't just talking to the pastor of the church at Ephesus. He's talking to the whole church of Ephesus. See, sometimes we think, oh, that's this kind of life you're talking about, that's for the spiritual superstars. That's for the pastor. That's for the elders. That's for the staff. And I'm just, see, I'm just a normal, everyday, ordinary guy. And I, you know, this spiritual thing, I'm just glad I'm not going to hell when I die. That's all I want to know. I'm going, I'm going to heaven. God did not save you just to get you out of hell. And God did not save you just to get you to heaven. God saved you to be His ambassador on this planet. And the only way we can do that is in the power of the Spirit. Amen. So it's for every believer. Now this is where the catch comes in. It's a command, but it's passive. It's passive voice. He said, be filled. 
He didn't say, go fill yourself. He said, be filled. In other words, this is something that happens to us. It's something that happens for us. So how am I commanded to do something that I can't do? It's something for me. Here, I, let me give you the best translation I could give you in that passage. When he said, be filled with the Spirit, and it's continuous, and it's a command, here's what I think he's saying. Live continuously in a fillable position. Put yourself in a fillable position. Put yourself with your sail up. That's your part. You can't make the wind blow. You can't fill yourself. There's no seminars on how you can fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. But there is a command of God to put yourself in a position where you are yielded to God, ready for God, wanting God, putting it up. And in that way, he says, now live that way constantly. Live in a fillable position. Got it? That's what he's saying. Live in a fillable position. And all of that is in this one passage I read to you where it says, be filled with the Spirit. Now let's think about that just for a minute. I want to talk to you about God's wind and your boat. I have noticed in my years of living for Christ and my years of being a pastor and teacher of the Bible, I've noticed that there are two basic ways people try to live the Christian life. One of them is the or life. Row, 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 gently to the church. Merrily, 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 I can't row anymore. <laughs> or life. You know, we have this crazy idea that when you accept Jesus, you jump in a boat and grab two oars and go, as I'm living for Jesus, I'm doing all the stuff at church they ask. I'm going to join the production team. I don't even know what the soundboard looks like. I'm going to join. Wow. There's just more I can do for Jesus. After a while, it's like, oh, I can't do this. Let me tell you what Paul says to the or life. In another book, he wrote, the book of Galatians. Galatians 3.3. The New Living Translation says, Have you lost your senses? Once again, he's saying, Are you stupid? <laughs> Paul was a man that didn't miss words. Had, after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? He said, Do you think that the spirit that came into you when God breathed on you and you were born again, that now to go on to maturity, it's you rolling boat. He said, have you lost your mind? God didn't just save you to leave you. He saved you to continue to work in you. Cooperate with God. Move with God. Be filled with the spirit. Listen to his voice. The sale life is the opposite way. The or life is what so many Christians live. And they get burned out on religion. They get burned out on legalism. They got a list of rules. We got to keep all the rules. We got to get the rules right. But there is another way and I call it the sail life. Anybody in here done sailboating? That's what something you like to do? I had a feeling there were some sailors in here. Now, I want to give you a script that it almost sounds like Paul is saying the opposite thing. Again, another book he wrote, Colossians. Paul wrote, these, all three of these books were written while Paul was in prison, by the way. Colossians 1.29. And he was talking about how much he loved the Colossian church and he was working for them. He said, that's why I'm working so hard day after day. Stop right there. That sounds like he's rowing a boat. Yeah, Paul, you're, yeah, you're doing it, Paul. He says, that's why I'm working so hard. He said, so hard. Day after day, year after year, doing my best for Jesus. That's not what he said. Because notice the last phrase. With the energy God so generously gives me. He said, everything I have. He said, see, the sale life is not a lazy life. 
Cell life says, oh, I'm just sitting there, just floating around, waiting for wind. No. The cell life is you are serving God in a powerful way, but it is the energy of the wind that is moving you, not your ability. Paul said, I'm not, Paul was working hard. Look at Paul's life, my word. The man was beaten and stoned. Stone me, they threw rocks at it. Today I have to explain that. Some people think they got drunk. Stone, they threw rocks at it. I mean, I had a guy come to church with him. He never was raised in church. And I said, and hey, Paul was stoned. And he came to me and said, what did that mean? He said, oh, I was thinking like what I used to do. But uh, I always have to say, you know, he rock beaten. He was in prison. You know, when Paul went to a town, he wasn't thinking about what the penthouse was looking about, going to look like. He said, I wonder what the jailhouse is like in this town. But chances are, oh, that's where I'm going to be. And you look at him and say, how did he do this? Because he wasn't doing it in his own strength. He was doing it as he was moved by the power of the Spirit. And that is how he lifted up to us in these passages. We are supposed to live. Yes. Amen. We're supposed to live. But here's the problem. We Christians often struggle with the problem of knots and tears. Knots and tears. I preached this sermon the first time I preached it. I preached this sermon several times. It's just a key message I want to deliver to people. I preached it first at City Church a number of years ago, and I had a guy come up to me to in the service. And this part of what I'm teaching you now wasn't in the sermon that he came to me and he said, Pastor, my problem is I've got knots, knots in my rope. Knots in my rigging. I can't get this out. I said, wow, what an insightful point. You see, if you've got knots in your rope, you, it won't go up. You know what knots are? It's the hindrances that we have in our life. I want to just be blunt. It's our sins that we haven't confessed. It's those things that we do and we know we're doing and God's not pleased with. And, and God is gracious, but at the same time, God wants to help untie those failures in your life. You see, don't let sin like dormant in your life. When the Spirit convicts you of something, say, God, forgive me. I'm sorry, I'm dying. Let me give you another metaphor that Paul used in another place. Not Paul, excuse me, but the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 1, we see a similar thinking, but he's using a different metaphor. It's not a, it's not a ship, it's a race. And the writer of Hebrews says, let us throw off everything that hinders us. And the sin that so easily entangles us. The writer of Hebrews is basically saying, you've got knots in your rope. That's why you're not making any progress. That's why there's something that Satan is using as a stronghold in your life and your sail is down. And so you're trying your best to make it rowing. And Satan is blowing the contrary wind towards you. And you're not making any progress. And you're feeling ashamed and you feel guilt. And you feel like everybody else in church has got all their act together but me. Oh, if you only knew. <laughs> but here's the deal. You will never get your sail up until you deal with, listen to me, that thing. So what does that mean? I said, because you know in your life what that thing is. And your thing may not be their thing, but it's the thing that you know that you feel most convicted about, that Satan beats you up and makes you feel condemned about. It's the thing that you know is hindering you from moving forward. That's a knot in your rope. And you've got to deal with it. You've got to bring it to God. It may not even be an action. It could be an attitude. That you're holding a grudge. You're holding a grudge. It could be that you're jealous of someone else. That seemingly has got something that you've always wanted, but you didn't get it. You won't get to say a lot. You gotta let God by His grace and by the work of His Spirit start untangling that rope. Does this make any sense? You got to untie the rope. The knots come. 
And I remember when the guy told me that, I said, what insight, Lord, did you just gave me? But then there's another issue. Your issue is not. Your issue is not not so. You should have tears in your sail. Your sail is ripped. Ever seen a picture of a sailboat that's been through some battles? Been through the wind? Shredded sails? Half hanging off? Flopping in the wind? That happens to us in life too. The tears are things that we kind of do to ourselves. The wounds are things that life does to us. Luke chapter 17 verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples, Hard trials and temptations are bound to come. You know, the Bible is not, could never be accused of false advertising. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's going to be easy living in the world. In fact, if many Bible scholars are correct, and the book of James is the first New Testament book written, that it was written before the Gospels. And James wrote his little book before. The first, the first inspired word after the resurrection of Jesus was this. Count it pure joy when you face the various trials of life. That's the first inspired New Testament verse. You're going to face various tests, trials. Trial of your faith works patience. But sometimes it also tears your soul. Sometimes it also rips you apart. And your sail is torn. Even if you were able to get it, get it up with the rope of your life, it wouldn't catch the wind. Because it's ripped. So what is the answer to that? Jesus said He came to bind up the broken heart. The Bible tells us that God is the healer of our brokenness. God can send other people in your life that we may need to share our heart with so they can speak into our life. Don't ever be afraid because, you know, he's so interesting. It is so interesting when you look at the New Testament. This is why small groups are so important. There are tons of one another passages in the New Testament. In fact, I decided a number of years ago, I was going to preach a series. I thought, a series of all the one another passages given, you know, one each week. Well, I was shocked. There's 54 of them. I said, can't do that. <laughs> like, love one another. Pray for one another. Confess your weaknesses one to another, that you may be healed. Bear with one another. Warn one another. Encourage one another. Just keep on going right down the line. Sometimes we need someone else to help us in those healing and those wounds. And God puts you in the body of Christ. See, the purpose of being in the body of Christ is not simply, the purpose of being in the body of Christ is not simply to provide you an opportunity to have a concert and a lecture every week. I'm not do, do this part is I'm, I'm the lecturer so I'm not putting it down okay but it's more than this it's so that we can build unique and special relationships with each other see what I'm trying to say so that we can have we can encourage one another we can pray one for another we can confess to one to another and that's the beauty of the body of Christ so somebody in this room, your problem with raising the sail is you've got knots in your own. And it's that thing. It's that thing that God has been dealing with you about, but so far you haven't really, you know, you know who we, we are. We do this. When God starts dealing us with about that thing, we just turn the praise music up loud so we don't hear it. <laughs> Get it real loud. <laughs> and for some of you, you're wounded. You're hurting. Been hurting for some time. And right now, you don't like this sermon. Because I'm putting my finger on where you're hurting. I've been to the doctor and said, hey doc, I got a pain right here. You know what he does? He doesn't take this wrist and start twisting. He goes, right here. Go, oh yeah, right there. <laughs> Because until you put your finger on it, you're never going to deal with it. Sometimes you got to let God push and say, this is where you need me. This is where you need me to make you whole. This is where you've got to let go of that grievance. This is where you've got to be free from that, um, that disappointment.
this is where you've got to let go of that offense. This is where you've got to forgive. That's how you begin to get your cell up. All of us get our cell up and we feed our soul in different ways. Some people are fed by quiet times with God. Everybody needs to have a quiet time with God, but some people, that's your time of getting your cell up. Some people are get their step up when they're out serving in a way. They may be out serving the poor and all of a sudden, man, this is what, I mean, they're just, they're just being nourished and their cell is up. Others are people who get deep in the Word and they start looking at Greek and Hebrew. That's kind of me. When I start reading the Word, my cell is going up. My cell. See, we don't all have to get our cell up the same way, but you need to know what feeds your soul and what strengthens your life and make sure that that's a part of your life because God wired you that way and that's the way you need to be. Amen. Amen. So, what's the glory of sailing with God? At the end of the passage, here's what Paul said. He said, when you're sailing with God, you'll have a song in your heart. He said, you'll be singing and making music to the Lord in your heart. In other words, your life will be a song. Now, your life will have a melody. There's a joy in your life. He said, second thing will happen, you'll encourage others. He said, not only will that song be in you, but the song of your life. And, there's, and our songs may be different. There's something in you. He said, you will also speak to others with these hymns and spiritual songs at God's place. That doesn't mean you walk around singing to somebody, how are you today? <laughs> Well, Arthur from Tennessee, it's so good to see you. <laughs> no. But there's something about the radiant atmosphere of your life that other people begin to experience. They feel encouraged. People will feel encouraged being around you. You will be encouraged. That's what he said in that passage. There's another thing he said. He said in this passage, you'll have an attitude of gratitude. He said, you'll, give, you'll always give thanks to God for all things. Your person is so thankful what God has done. And you'll have a heart to serve. He said, you'll submit. You know what to submit means? You'll serve. He said, you'll have a heart of serving. That's what happens when you get yourself up. The song, you encourage, you give thanks, and it leads you into a life of serving God. So why did God lay on my heart to preach this message here today? I assume because somebody needed to hear it. I assume that God loves you enough that He sent a God from Chattanooga to say this to you. The spirit for life is when you catch the wind. Never once since that morning when the Lord told me my spirit's always moving, have I ever prayed again? The Lord let your spirit move. Never once. Because the spirit is always moving. If he ceased to move, he had ceased to be the spirit. He is always moving. He's moving in Las Vegas. What we have to do is find out what God is doing and join him. <laughs> Rather than say, God, bless what I'm doing, we need to say, God, help me do what you're blessing. Let me capture it. And God, I'm going to bring my knotted rope to you. I'm going to bring that thing that I know you want to do with your mind. I'm going to bring it to you. Or God, I'm bringing my ripped soul to you. I've been hurt. I was hurt in church and God, what am I doing back? Because God wants to go hurt. Some of you perhaps have been hurt years ago by abuse or something else. You need to bring that heart to God. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're moving in this room. I have felt, even as I preached, the guidance that you can provide. I pray for the, I pray for the person who needs to bring the thing to you. Who needs
needs to bring a knotted soul up that can't get the sail up because there's just so much stuff there that needs to be dealt with. And I pray for a person whose soul has been ripped for a long time. And every time they start trying to make progress, they only go on a short distance. Because the pain, the hurt, the wound is there. They can't overcome it. And I don't know why you, Lord, can choose this moment. Choose this moment. someone who's here that maybe doesn't even have a relationship with you. That you would speak to them today and let them know the Spirit is moving all around them. All they got to do is say, yes, Jesus. And with that simple statement, yes, Jesus, I give myself to you. A sail starts to go up and not start to be untied. And soul healing begins to occur. So I ask you, Lord Jesus, I ask you that they too would find the Spirit to be the new direction of their life. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. Amen. Look up at me for a moment. I feel like one of the ways the Spirit is moving today, and I don't do this every sermon I preach. Sometimes I do, but I just feel like it's what God wants. I think God would be pleased if you're here and you say, Pastor, this was my word. This was my word today. And you know how you feel like it's God, you know, God's word? It's almost like is there anybody in here other than me? Because I feel like this is a sermon just toward me. But there will be one. If you're here and say, I've got lots in my room and I want one time. If you're here and you say, I've got a ripped soul and I'm going to heal it. If you're here today and say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, I would like to. I would like to. I'm going to ask you to take a few steps from where you are in a row. Come down here. If you think it would be beneficial for you to come down and say, Would you pray? I'm going to ask your ministry team, is that what it's called? Come on up, whoever those folks are. I want you to be up here too. And you say, Well, I've never been to this church before. What do y'all do? I said, We do what the New Testament did. We're just going to place our hand on your shoulder or maybe wherever, take you by the hand and just pray with you. That's it. So I don't like walking down in front of people, nor do I. Introverted people you've probably ever met. But here's the deal. Sometimes we have to make a movement. We have to move. And here's my thinking. If we can't be honest in church, we need to shut it down. There's no reason to be here. Let's just shut it down and let them put a coffee shop in it. Church is where we should be able to be honest. Where we should be honest. I say, friends, I need to go down for prayer. Stand with you. I'm going to pray one more time. And when I say amen, when I say amen, if you say, I'm one of those who need to go down, it'll be a brief prayer. But you say, I want someone to pray with me. You may have a friend that says, I'll go with you. You know what that thing is. Don't walk out the door with that thing unaddressed in your life by God. And don't leave until God can heal the wound. I'm going to pray. Father, your spirit is moving now. There's some of us who've got to sail up. We sense that moving. Our hearts are turning toward that direction. We are turning this way because we feel the wind is moving this way. Now I pray that that wind would give courage 
to a person that you love, Jesus, to say, I want to come for prayer. Yes. I ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. And everybody said amen. Yes. If I said amen, you come.